God, that was weird. I know. I haven't seen that in so long. It was kind of great to see it. Well, I, I haven't seen it projected in uh, 16 millimeter for at least 25 right. years when I used to be in the back of the theater with my projector having to stop and put on the next reels. And every time it would break, I'd have to change it. And oh, it was a nightmare. So at least they had to worry tonight. I didn't. <laughs> true. And it looked good. It actually looked well, good. Well, good. Well, I mean, on uh, projection. <laughs> Yeah, I'm amazed that print is as good. That sat in my attic for 30 years. Uh, that print is the one that I used to have when I would go around the country and right. have them in the trunk of my car and get bookings and stand on the corner and give out flyers and stuff. So, It's so fabulously fucked up, though. I forgot about all the religious stuff, and this is the most extreme. of. You always have, like, religious visions and, and things like that, but this one had, like... The Infant of Prague, it had rosary jobs, it had... I, know. I told Willem Dafoe, you know, when okay. he was in all the trouble with the Last Temptation of Christ, I think, oh, we got worse than that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If they had known about that, if they had only known about that, yeah. they would have yeah. gone Bruce. Well, Bruce. that, when the Maryland Censor Board finally saw this uh -huh. film, like... 15 years after we made it, because it was finally going to play at the Charles Theater, she went so insane when she saw it. And she said, my eyes were insulted for two hours. And, and the judge said, but it's not illegal. And, and where we filmed that rosary job, Howard Gruber, but first of all, Howard Gruber, People forget in the 60s, right. churches let revolutionary Black Panthers and everything have meetings and the war. Right. So we, Jack Walsh went in and he was a yippee and pretended that he was talking about politics to the priest while we shot that. Well, and he was in the other room. They were talking about Vietnam and everything. And we were in there shooting the rosary job. <laughs> and shooting and, up. And, and, and shooting up. That was so gratuitous, <laughs> that shot. I can't <laughs> believe that shot is so gratuitous. That like, Jack, he just died, by the way. A junkie to the end. And uh, come on in, you know, shoot up on the altar, you know. And the poor priest came to the premiere. What did he say? And he was shaking. And I said, don't worry, I'll never tell. And to this day, I don't know where that church is. It looks like I the church blocked in female it. trouble. No, it's it not the church in female oh, trouble. No, the church in female trouble. Later, the priest's wife called and tried to get me to testify in the divorce case oh. that she, he let him film a <laughs> porno movie in the church. <laughs> and I hung up on her. A bitch. Right. But this poor priest, and he didn't know what we were shooting. He said, please oh, yeah. don't ever tell anybody where you shot this movie. But if you went to that church, I think you could recognize it. <laughs> Nothing ever happened, though, as far as I know. Nobody ever did it. Good no. Lord. <laughs> and how, where did you film the, the you know, Stations of the Cross scene? That was in Hamden on this one street that still kind of looks like that, only it's been yuppified now and restored. That was right. George Figgs' house, who plays Jesus. Right. And um, George Figgs was a lot of my movies. He was in Dribbles. He was here the other night at the opening. So that was filmed there just one Sunday afternoon. And I kept watching that whole cavalcade of perversion. That's my parents' house in the background. <laughs> we filmed that on my parents' front lawn. They were liberal, weren't they? Because they were very conservative. My parents were not, like, arty or anything. So they were, why did they look out the window and see that? <laughs> God. And then when Devon's looking at the end, looking at those houses, that's a cross. We didn't yeah. ask those neighbors. They were probably <laughs> sitting in their living room. <laughs> we didn't have, I didn't know you were supposed to ask. <laughs> so Devon would just get out, do it, you know. What about the car? Where did you get the car? You I don't remember where that car, we from a junkyard, obviously, yeah, right. you know. Uh, but the, the shot in the beginning when David Lockery drives that Cadillac, that was his car. Oh. But that scene where they park, it just died on the way in town. <laughs> and we left it there forever. <laughs> In that parking lot of the projects. That's where we pulled in and just left that car there. And that was the last shot. That's why you don't see him getting out and going in my house where we filmed that. Because the car died on the way. <laughs> but Devine's such a trooper. I mean, running through the snow in a fur coat. <laughs> I know. But worse was to come because then he ate dog shit. Know. You know, but, <laughs> but there was this trainer was, wheels. Yeah. This was trainer wheels. Eating like guts. eating that eating guts, guts. And we got that old heart had been sitting around, not on ice or anything, too. It stunk. I remember. Oh, that old heart. That butcher at the Lexington Marcus loved us, though, because we used to go in there and he'd Get say, I got this one. I got that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God.
But this is like the first, um, I think you worked, Vince Perennio was the first movie yeah. he worked on, Who, too. He is in Lobstora. You can see his legs. It's he and his brother and are in Lobstora. And we buried Lobstora. Later, we threw it in the Inner Harbor. You did? Yeah, because we had it for, so, it took up so much room, and for yeah. years, we had to bury it. So we took it to now as Harbor Place in Baltimore, right. this fancy area. Then it was, you know, lesbian bars and sailors. Right. And, uh, and we threw it in the water. So it's buried in the it Inner is. Harbor. Yeah, I guess by now it's gone. Oh. <laughs> and Edith Massey was in Pete's bar. That's, that's where she where worked. You, where she worked, right? That's where we really met her, and she worked in there, and and that's how Sue Lowe and Vince found her. And Sue, said, you got to meet this woman, right? right? So we went there, and that's exactly what she looked like. Yeah. And you know, we all hung out there. Drinks were ten cents. <laughs> Except Devon, he hated it there. Oh, he did. Yeah, I'm not going down to that wino no. pit. Right, right. So, but, but, um, yeah, that was where we met Edith, and that was her at work. Oh God, and Cookie too, and Cookie Mueller. It was. Uh, and how we how we met Cookie? Yes. Yeah, and there's a great new book coming out about Pook, Cookie oh, that I'm really great. pushing because it's really well done, and it comes out in October called Edgewise, the Cookie Mueller story, and everybody she found, the family, everybody, everybody yeah. tells everything, including you. She's re- it's, it's really good. Book. But Cookie, and this sounds like a studio made this up in the publicity department, but she was at the premiere of Mondo Trasho in a church, and we used to always give door prizes, like dinner for two at the Little Tavern, like the (laughs) worst restaurant in town, right? And she had been released from a mental institution in California and came back to Baltimore and was her first night out, and she won the door (laughs) prize at Mondo Trasho, and we met her, and then Steve Yeager filmed that, the, the... the the, the the her going to the little tavern in the limo to eat and I don't know where that film is and <laughs> then we met Cookie and then we put her in Multiple Maniacs and we hung out with her you know and he, she was in all the movies but um she always played Divine's daughter I, I mean yeah 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 she, and she was kind of, they got along well yeah yeah <laughs> it's good. in real life yeah and I look you know in those crowd scenes I can say that's Mink and Bonnie you right. can see them all they're in the fifty parts in they're it they're in the suburban house and line. at the end I could name every one of those people every one of those soldiers. Running down the street almost. A couple of them just joined us. The little kids started running. I don't know where he came from. Believe me, we didn't have SAG there with, you know. I mean, yeah, that blind man, he's in every shot, though. Do you know? I'd say you can't be in this one for continuity. He'd just run around and get in it. Right. And that poor woman, that blonde woman, she was very sweet. To us. She was an art teacher in the public school that took sympathy on us. Yeah, tried to be encouraging when no other teacher ever was. And she was down there running at six in the morning and getting Divine pull her out of the car in a one-piece bathing suit. She was good. She was a good teacher. Right. <laughs> And where were you filming in the street? On the streets, where was it? Fells Point. At the yeah, end, that was all in Fells Point. Oh, yeah, it was. and uh, and Divine's house was my apartment, right. but I live with Mary Vivian Pierce. I live with Bob Skidmore, like a lot of the different ones. But I still have dreams about that apartment, recurring dreams that I go there and I think, oh, I still live here. Oh. All this stuff is in, and I re- look on the walls. I know where every one of those is. things are, you know. And that Warhol poster is worth. I wish I still had that one, you know. But. Um, I have recurring dreams about that apartment because I lived there for many years, but I was, we didn't have any money, so I'd go to Provincetown in the summer and have to move out. And then I'd come back in the fall and nobody would rent it and I'd move back in. Oh, so I didn't keep it for the summer. I couldn't afford those three months. Yeah. So we filmed Mondo Trasho and Multiple Maniacs in there. Yeah. And the first floor was a plumbing school. So in that scene when Divine's getting raped by the lobster and screaming, there was a plumbing school right downstairs where they were like trying to study. And we'd have to walk through it to get to our apartment. So they would just be sitting there, and we'd come in the door, and they'd just stop working on their pipes and look at us. And we'd walk up the step. But the man that ran the printing school came to the premiere. He did? Yeah, they were nice. Yeah, they ran with it, you know. Oh this was the poster we used to have to put up in the movie theater, too. You won't believe this <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, Dennis worked in all the theaters in Provincetown where we met that played all these right. movies we'd forever. Played midnight every summer. We'd run yeah. them all summer long, too. And the audiences would go nuts. They were really were fun. And, and this movie was made of the hippie years. This was right. hardly a hippie movie. But hippies liked it because it was like making fun of their rules. The same way today you could make fun of political correctness or gay right. rules or anything. I'm still doing the same thing. Right. Only the Manson stuff in it is but so horrifying to me. We took Sharon credit thing. for it before they even they caught them. Manson. <laughs> They and that's why they you. caught him while we were shooting. So that's why I have that child. Who are these people? I, I, I had to throw that in. <laughs> you, t- 
What was I thinking? You know, De- Devon's father always used to say that. What are you thinking about? And that's a good question. What the hell was I thinking about? Yeah. And this was the first sync sound besides. Yeah, that's why they're yelling all the time. And it was, it was done with the kind of camera that's a newsreel camera. This was before video cameras. So this was single system sound, and that's how they filmed all newsreel cameras. So every shot, when you cut it, the sound was right on the film, 24 frames ahead, so on the projector. So when you had a cut, it was the Warhol movies, the Warhol Morrissey movies were like that too. You had to overlap the sound on the first frame. That's why there's long takes. You didn't have A and B rolls. You couldn't cut back and forth. It was like shooting a play. And they had long pages of dialogue. They like really like when sure. David Lockery and Bonnie are in bed, Mary Vivian Pierce, they have to talk for like three, three days, you know. And really, I would have cut this shorter. I did learn to edit a little better. <laughs> you know, because I, I thought, oh, cut, cut, cut. You know, I show something. It has to break every window in that car. <laughs> Not really? one. Not it one goes around air. every <laughs> fucking window, <laughs> including the tail light. The tail yeah. light, too. I thought. I know. <laughs> And I love you so fucking much I could shit. I mean, well, they talk about a romantic line. Well, that is a nice thing to say to someone. Except I tried yeah. it. I tried that once. And it, just as a joke, and yeah. boy, did it bad. Yeah, I guess. You have to know the person know well. The it can't be the first time you tell them yeah, you love them. It's really true. It's not a good thing. Yeah, idea. yeah. It's true. Or it depends what they're like, you know, if they <laughs> have a good sense of humor. But it's, yeah, they could take it the wrong way. Now, you experimented by the Diane Linkletter story by using the camera. <laughs> well, so experimenting, that, yeah. Well, yeah, Diane Linkletter, all it was was it was right before we shot this, and I had to test the camera with sound, which I was so excited to be able right. to talk. You know, this was because yeah. the local reviewer that hated me in Baltimore said, this is my first talkie is also my first sickie. <laughs> of course, we put that right in the ads, right. <laughs> but, but um, so yeah, I could talk. So we were just experimenting with it, and right. That day, Diane Linkletter had committed suicide, so we said, let's shoot this. You know, Divine doesn't even have on a costume. He has a day-old beard and, like, <laughs> no makeup and my old bathrobe or something. I don't know where we got the bathrobe. So it was just a test for the camera. It was never yeah. – sp- and, and they're improvising. And you can tell the Dreamland gang was not used to that <laughs> because I always had, daddy. like, so many pages of dialogue we had to memorize and rehearse and everything. So, so it was not a real movie, and it still isn't. Well, but <laughs> – but- <laughs> Um, Diane Linkletter, I mean, to set it up, Art Linkletter was this big TV host. Very right wing, a friend of yeah. Nixon and everything. And, house party. And, and he had a show called Kids Say the Darndest yeah. Things, where he tricked children into talking about going to the bathroom right. while the audience went, <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, but <laughs> Diane Linkletter supposedly yeah. committed suicide on LSD, so it was a right. big thing. He put out a record called We Love You, Call Collect Diane, oh. which is in worse taste than my movie. But... Uh, <laughs> It came out, and I told this the other night, it's true. On the Watergate tapes they're still releasing, about 10 years ago they released one where it was Nixon and Art Linkletter conspiring to blame her death on Timothy Leary when she had not had acid for a year. Uh It was bullshit. She wasn't Uh tripping when she did it. And I won't name this person, but some people know him. Don't say (laughs) who, because he's uptight about it. I have a friend that bought this apartment in L.A. This was 10 years ago. Moved in, and the next morning he's walking down the hall, this queen that lives on the hall said, hey, guess who lived in your apartment? And it was the one Diane Linkletter jumped out of the window. (laughs) And now they've changed the windows, everything. And I said, let's have a seance. Let's go up there. <laughs> and he gets really mad if I bring it up because he doesn't think it's funny. Things, I, I know. And I like Diane. We she should have come with us. Yeah. yeah. Because uh, we didn't weren't we weren't against her. We were just right. this whole thing that they tried to make this this big thing. Like every time you took acid, acid you would you jump out the window. window. Yeah. Right. You know. Um, but I was thinking about the cavalcade of perversions because in in each your makeup you have a whole scene, a horror house scene. Yeah. They go in in like a shopping cart. And they see little scenes of horror, and there's scenes of like people like watching TV, yeah, yeah. you know, and ah, <laughs> yeah. or like the other one was he smoking pot and gets busted, like, yeah, ah, and a Girl Scout. <laughs> so yeah, that was Lizzie like, Temple Black, right? Oh, I think um, it was a complete warm up to that. It probably was. You yeah. can see certain themes, Theme yeah, yeah, in this true. movie. I mean. It definitely, you know, the right. the infant of Prague was something in Baltimore that they always had everywhere, and and his I liked him because his slogan was "The more you honor me, the more I will bless you." <laughs> oh, well, that seems fair. That yeah. <laughs> Who was the infant of Prague? Where the infant of Prague name? was Michael Renner's son, and I don't know where he is today. I also don't know the puke eater's name even. Oh, you don't? No, and I'd like to see him. <laughs> 
uh, because <laughs> most everybody in that movie, I can s- tell you who they are, but I don't remember his name or why, where he is today. Probably not looking to be discovered as the puke eater. <laughs> The yeah. Oh, hi. You must. You were the puke eater. Yeah. Well, the guy with the singing asshole in Baltimore. He said he has never been recognized once because he said they're not looking at my face. And but but he says the muscles ain't what they used to be. And and he's at my Christmas party every year. And people say, who is that? That's the asshole and sing flamingos. And he does have a certain celebrity. He does. Yeah. People shake your hand. Yeah. He should go to those horror conventions. You know, and sit in the booth. <laughs> He'd make money at it. He should do that. I'm going to tell him that. Yeah. His wife just rolls her eyes. Oh, Christ. Because I think he married her later in his career. Did right. he tell people at work? He, he would, would at work, he would say, I want to see a movie of it, <laughs> and then leave him pick flamingos. And I think they call the police and stuff. It's like sexual harassment at work. Yeah. And he said, what'd they say? He said, they refuse to comment. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're at work, they want to see a picture of me, and then have to look at their asshole, and they're at the desk next to you. You know, it would be awkward. Oh my god! <laughs> now, Mondo Trasha, what? what oh. Well, how did you? I mean, it, I was. How did I? Bonnie's bad day. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is a. It's a silent movie, basically, right. with just pop songs, and it's um, it's one horrible day in her life when she gets run over by a hit and run driver, right? And uh. I don't know what it was reviewed. Of course, of Mondo Connie and all those movies that come out. It has nothing to do with that, though, really. Even and in the beginning, it's really long, like Bonnie waits for the bus. And people say, well, why didn't you cut it shorter? I said, well, it was Sunday. The buses don't run as much. <laughs> and she's reading Hollywood Babylon. Yeah, and she looked like that in real life. She then. did. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but at, when we were making this movie, she was also worked in the racetrack in the day, so she'd come home in her double life and then get in the drag of looking like yeah. this. Um, and she's still a very, very dear friend of mine. She lives in Nicaragua. She's the only one that's been in every single one of my yeah, movies. She, she was in Hag in a Black right. Leather Jacket, too. So I met her with my parents. We're best friends until we were juvenile delinquents together, and then we were forbidden to see each other by the police and our parents. And <laughs> then they made up later in life, though our parents did, right. which was good. Yeah. <laughs> But, and I love the scene in the park, too. Which park did you film? I think that was Wyman Park, park yeah. But we got busted in Mondo Treasure in the scene That's there where Divine imagines a hitchhiker's nude and is, Divine is driving a red Cadillac right. Eldorado convertible. <laughs> and the police, we didn't ask at Hopkins. We just filmed there. And somebody called the cops that we were making a porn movie. And the cops raided it. We all ran. And we <laughs> escaped and Divine got away, which is pretty funny <laughs> considering it was November. He was in a red Cadillac convertible with a top down and a gold old LeMay Toyota outfit <laughs> and there was a nude man in the back seat <laughs> and they couldn't they find him <laughs> in downtown Baltimore <laughs> and we got busted and then they I remember I, David Lockery passed me a fan made out of a double mint gum it was so gene from the cell next to me <laughs> and what happened is me of course I call the uh Civil Liberties Union, and it happened to be the one day that they answered the phone and they took the case. So it was a huge national publicity. It was on the cover of Variety. It was all over. And we didn't plan it. And we got off eventually. And the the judge read us a poem and quote, go behind the door and sin no more. And then I had to go down to the district attorney. I had to show them my movies. And they thought we were a porno ring. And so I showed them Hag in a black leather jacket. And they're like so disappointed. Right? Because they thought they they were going to see full beaver. Right. You know? So... um, uh, you know, the whole thing was so ridiculous, but that just happened in the middle of it. And the poor woman that rented us the Cadillac, she rented to us again later. She, even though her car was in the in the incident, and that's when they came to Mink's house and busted her, and she was in the shower, and they came right in. She said there was more exposure in the arrest than the incident, <laughs> and they and they had all our names and addresses in the paper, and we all lived with our parents and stuff. And Mink's mother was getting obscene phone calls and everything. <laughs> Oh, it was a nightmare. A nightmare. <laughs> ah, so oh, youth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and where did it play? Where did oh, it, it played in churches. It had the premiere. But right. then it played like once in a while in this place in Sampson Street in Philadelphia. It played in L.A. Um, at the Underground Cinema 12 Circuit. It played. It played yeah. not in New York. Oh, it did. This is the first time it's ever played in New York, oh, I really? think. Well. Wow. Maybe, because Multiple Maniac never played in New York till after Pink Flamingos right. was a hit, and then New Line had it at the Elgin for a couple of weeks. Right. But they never played before. They played around the country before New York. Oh, I see. I couldn't remember that, too. 
And the fr the early movies, they were shot on eight, on eight millimeter. Yeah, not even Super Eight. Right. And yeah. how did you do the sound mix? <laughs> no, the sound. They were both those movies. Well, Hag, Roman, and Eat Your Makeup right. all had. The sound was never on the film. It had reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder that I would come and go, one, two, start. And then sometimes I'd have to stop it in between to catch up, like right. especially for the gunshot on the Kennedy assassination. So it was only I could present it. I mean, <laughs> and so that's why they're on. I put them on DVD for this because you right. can't show the film. There's not even a print. It's like tape splices, the kind in hobby shops, you know, that you put down and like peeled the thing off and did it. So all that equipment is so over. You'll never find any of that again. And that's why I'm sure these will never be shown on 16 millimeter again right. because even if they do come out again, multiple maniacs, which we're trying to do with the music, is they won't be on 16 millimeter no. ever, you know? So this will probably be the last screening of them. They didn't catch on fire. I know, yeah. I was impressed. Yeah, but Mondo <laughs> Trasho might. Yeah. It's older. Yeah. Um, I found some of the old um, flyers for, let's see, for, let me see. Yes, here it is, Roman Candles, the world premiere. The world premiere. And that was at Flower Mart Day in Baltimore, which was a big arts festival that people went to. And we had it in a church, and it was a big hit. And, and that was my star was Malcolm Soul, who was really before Divine. And Divine was scared of Malcolm. She was like a beatnik goddess, and she was great. She lived in New York, and she was in Life magazine as a beatnik. And right. she looked like that with the maroon hair and all that makeup. She wore that every single day of her life. I mean, she could barely go out of her house. People threw rocks at her. They did. Yeah. She, she was the great. The thing that's so weird about her on film is that she looks like an old soul. She was 27 when she died. Really? And um, yes, but she was young. There's something but, weird about yeah. her on, on screen, though. And especially that scene in Eat Your Makeup of when she pulls up and kidnaps Marina. Yeah. Uh, she just has this look on her that's like bizarrely. Well, she died right after yeah. that, actually, you know. And uh, she was great. I love Malcolm. I mean, she was such an influence on all of us because she was really a fashion radical. And she was a beatnik. And that's what we all wanted to be when we were young. But we were in Lutherville, Maryland. You couldn't be a right. beatnik there. It was hardly a hotbed of bohemia. But right. when we came down and met Malcolm, it was, she was the real thing to us. So, right. she, so she was in all the movies from and, the beginning. And she, what Pat said, she liked to drink Fresca and eat chalk. Is that true? She did eat chalk every Why? day because she had some calcium deficiency oh. or something. <laughs> so she just, she'd sit there and she'd be eating an entire box of chalk. I forgot about that, but I that is true. That yeah. I thought that is really Yeah. Weird. I guess today they'd have a pill for that. <laughs> But she was 27 when she died? She was 27 when she died. I think she, they gave her too many pills or something. She died in the middle of the riots for Martin Luther King. Really? And the funeral was the day Baltimore was burning down. And we went. But there was National Guard. And you weren't allowed to leave the house. It was a, it was a curfew. And there was tanks out front of my house. And, and we were going like big um, t you know, National Guard. would hit the bumper of your car when you were driving to get you off the street. But we went to the funeral. Where was the funeral? Was yeah, I don't know. She was buried over in East Baltimore because it was, she was, I, I, I don't remember, to be honest, but we went. Right. Yeah. Where did you meet up with her? In, Mount, in Mardix, Mardix, which was this bar, this beatnik right. bar downtown. And I couldn't get in, so I hung out on the alley for two years. And But I talked to all the beatniks would come out and talk to me. They know I was the kid that made these movies. So, um, right. And I couldn't go in. And my mother used to drive me and let me off there and said, maybe you'll meet people here. <laughs> that you can you know, which is amazing when that you is. think about it. She drove me downtown and dropped me off in an alley? <laughs> Jesus, God, dude. But, but yeah, she was right. Yeah. I did meet people. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a good career I move. I they were very supportive of that. They were, considering, Imagine, you know, that my parents were not bohemians. They were not... Uh, right you know, avant-garde types and everything. My mother's brother was for a while undersecretary of the interior for Nixon. Right. So um, it was awkward at the time, yeah. And what they were, but I mean, they never saw the early movies. Though. Yeah, my mother went to see Mondo Trash or by herself and said, you're going to die in a mental institution, commit suicide or OD. But then she grew to understand yeah. them better. Yeah. <laughs> I tell you, her best line on A Dirty Shame, she said, oh, God, what's this one about? And I said, sex addiction. She said, maybe we'll die first. <laughs> <laughs> I liked your father. Who yeah, said, my father said, it was funny, but I hope I'll never see it I again. Never yeah. see that again. That's a good review. <laughs> <laughs>
And what about Eat Your Makeup? I, I, lo- I really like Eat Your Makeup. There's something well, it has about moments. That. You when, know, they yeah, all have they, moments. They but they that's <laughs> women and force them to model themselves to death. Well, it's Fashion them. Week, so, yeah, you know, it seems fashion. like the perfect time for that. A lot of people are eating their makeup and modeling themselves to death right now, probably in the tents right out here. I know, um, right before eating little eyeliner brushes. It's yeah, so she is eating. But, well, she that. eats little eyeliner brushes and this and then shoots up eyeliner right. later. Right. Yeah. Eye makeup was important. <laughs> um, the movie, I think the Kennedy assassination thing, when I look back on it, I can't even believe we did that. But then later it came out, only I found out last year, that Warhol did the exact same thing in the exact same year, a movie called Still. He and did? they do the Kennedy assassination, but it's just on the couch. And Mary oh. Warrenoff is Kennedy. Really? But no, they only showed it once recently. I but know. I never knew that. And it was never publicized or anything. Right. But we had a bigger budget than Warhol because we had the car, we had the outfits made, and that was flat. Panel, though, I'm afraid, that Chanel outfit. <laughs> and the poor woman that made that, Mrs. Meister, I still remember, she sneakily in the basement of her house made drag queen clothes. And don't let my husband see any of you. <laughs> because that's how she made a living. All the drag queens would go over there and she would make their costumes for him. But she was real straight and she, her husband didn't know. You had to sneak downstairs. Oh. And she had a little drag business. <laughs> So she made the she suit. made the suit. Yeah, she made a lot of the stuff. Yeah, in those early days. Yeah, and that mink coat Divine wears. Yeah. I bought that for him, and I think it was like two hundred dollars, which was a lot then. And he wore it all the time, but he had to wear it in the movie if he was getting it. But it was a used, very used mink very coat. Used. Yeah, trudging through the yeah. snow in that mink coat. <laughs> But what year did you do the Kennedy assassination? What? Well, it was came out in '66, which meant we shot it in '65. And it, how, and it like, came, happened in 63, so believe right. me, people really didn't think didn't it was think funny. Was and uh, <laughs> and maybe it wasn't. And I mean... Didn't, didn't Divine's mother find the... No, the mother found the... the bl- she didn't know it was Divine or made movies right. or anything, but she found the bloody Jackie Kennedy <laughs> outfit wadded up in the trunk of her car. <laughs> said, what the hell is this? And he said, I am Jackie Kennedy. Because <laughs> he was stoned, and she didn't know what to say, and she just dropped it. No, what do you say? Oh, what are you thinking about? <laughs> That's all his father always said to him. <laughs> the thing that makes me crazy and eat your makeup, there's somebody reading Fact Magazine. Isn't that the first magazine you were ever published? That's actually... an obscure bit that he yeah. knows. The first thing I ever had published right. was in Fact Magazine that was put out by Ralph Ginsburg, who had Avant Garde Magazine. Right. But this was a scandal, tell the truth. It was a total lie. I made the whole thing up. It was called Inside an Unwed Mother's Home. But my pen name, Jane Wemo, get it, J-W. That was my fake name, Jane Wemo. And my friend did go to an unwed mother's home, and she told me the story. But I just completely made the whole thing up. And this magazine is called Fact, the Truth. It was a complete lie. The very first, a hundred bucks, a lot. Yes. It was my first published thing. Was that the issue that you were Yes. In oh, I don't know if it was. I can't remember if it was. But I have all those facts. Magazines, yeah, I have a lot of them. Because I yeah. saw that and it made me burst. Yeah, left that me. was a short. <laughs> that magazine was out for about a yeah, year. About a year. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> God. And I love in in Roman candles. You used those. Um, you slipped in little pieces of movies, weren't they? From those like yeah. old eight millimeter movies you that you get? bought in a hobby shop to yeah. show at children's birthday parties. They're like ten minutes of a movie. I think. Yeah. I, the only one I have left is. Uh, you have them. Frog. <laughs> yeah, but that was even later. But there yeah, were castle cool. films, I think. And, and you bought them for children's funny. birthday parties. And they had the Creature of the Black Lagoon. You had Creature and Walks Among Us. And you had like a Pope footage because they had yeah. that stuff. And then I had in one of the movies Lee Harvey Oswald's mother talking. You did. Yeah. And then in the beginning of Roman Candles is that wig commercial where it just it goes black and you don't even see the movie. And he's talking about he had this, and I imitated him as the Pink narrator Pink. in Pink Flamingos. But he said, "I will come to your home. These are the eyelashes that don't come off when you go swimming." And he was <laughs> so Mr. great. Mister Ray. Ray had an ad every day on the black radio stations, but he was white, and it would say like, "Come in today. I will give you a hair weave." And it was uh, it was the most <laughs> hideous ads. And he was so famous in Baltimore, but he never knew why everyone laughed about him. So I went in to try to get him to do be the narrator, and he said, "I'm quickly, no, 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 get out." <laughs> 
<laughs> and then he only found out when Oprah started in Baltimore. That's where she had her show before she got famous. And she had Mr. Ray Day on and then told him about me. And he said, well, I didn't know at the time and everything. But then when Mr. Ray died, Mr. J, his son, who I called myself in the movie not even knowing that was his son's name, left me all his ads. The Mr. Ray estate gave me no. all the stuff, which I still have from what Mr. Ray. Like? Every hideous commercial he ever did. <laughs> They're really good. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. my God, that's <laughs> too good. Um, so I don't know how long are we supposed. Are we on a, any time limit here? What do you say? Or wrap oh, it up? Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the hook. That means yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, it would be really nice to see multiple maniacs. You know. It's well, it's we'll see. I mean, yeah. it, you know, there's some music issues to be worked out. I'd like to see it too because I yeah. think there are moments in it, and I think you see it really how we started. And you know, my anti hippie movie. That movie was made. You know, Divine Man. I always say we made him to be Jane Mansfield and Godzilla. Right. Well, he was like Godzilla at right. the end. And and Divine was so unlike that in real life. Divine was shy. Divine was in high school a nerd. Anything like this. But he had so much rage locked in from being bullied and everything right. that this character could let him bring it all out and and he had a great time as you can see <laughs> yeah and, and, the, and the comic timing too with that the way he would give these reams of speeches divine was just a good actor right really from the beginning. good actor i know thank you all very much thank for coming you. thank you thank you dennis thank you, thank you.